morning, everyone. I'm Wendell Jones, and welcome to this edition of the platform. On this program, we examine national and international issues. And the Nassau Institute is doing a fine job in our country educating the Bahamian people on economic affairs, not only in the Bahamas, but uh, in the United States and around the world. And uh, from time to time, they would host um, seminars here and bring in to the country exciting guests. And one of the guests that we have in our country this week is Mr. Lawrence W. Reed, better known as Larry Reed. And uh, he became president of the Foundation for Economic Education in 2008. And prior to that, he was founder and president for 20 years of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy in Midland, Michigan. And he has taught economics full time and chaired the Department of Economics at Northwood University in Michigan from 1977 to 1984. He holds a bachelor's uh, degree in economics from Grove City College and, an, and a master of arts degree in history from Slippery Rock State University, both in Pennsylvania. And he holds two honorary doctorates, one from Central Michigan University in Public Administration and Northwood University in Laws in 2008. Uh, of course, his resume is as long as my arm, so <laughs> we're going to stop right there. Uh, but suffice it to say, he has been on the platform before, and uh, we had an interesting conversation with him, and so we are delighted that he's back here today. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Wendell. My pleasure. Uh, Godfrey Ennis is here as usual. Thank you. Nice, Thanks, nice to have you here, Godfrey. Thank you. And, um, I, I understand that you are going to be speaking on an exciting topic at the Nassau Institute. Well, I hope it'll be exciting. Uh, the topic is liberty and character. And my point in that talk is to explain that uh, you cannot have liberty unless people widely practice uh, certain traits of character, that the two go together. People have to be honest. They have to keep their word. They have to be humble and patient and courageous and perseverant. Uh, they have to be responsible. They have to respect the lives and property and contracts and rights of other people. Uh, and if you have all of that, then you have a chance as a society to be free. Okay. And successful? Uh, yes, I think so. Well, there are some people who have been successful and uh, uh, they've had some spotty characteristics or oh, character. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I think uh, the number one problem in our country is an erosion of character and it, you see it in every occupation. Mm -hmm. You see it in government, you see it in business, you see it in labor unions, uh, everywhere and uh, it concerns me very much. As a matter of fact, many people would suggest that the world economy uh, went south because of people with bad character. You have one in, in, in prison today who has built uh, people out of billions oh, of dollars. Yeah, uh, I know. Um, is it Murdoch? Uh, no, I know who you mean, the guy from New York. Uh, Madoff. 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 Uh, uh, Bernie Madoff. 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 Oh, yeah. Right. Talk about bad character. Absolutely. Uh, but we have bad ideas and bad policy, too, uh, that make it even worse. In fact, some of that bad policy is the result of bad character. Bad policy. You, you, you're talking about um, policy uh, put in place by the state. That's right. Ba uh, some uh, bad laws, bad regulations, uh, special favors for for a certain powerful few, uh, that's not just bad economics in my view, it's bad character in most cases. Interesting. Godfrey? Uh, Mr. Reed, uh, in your recent, in your country's recent general election, uh, the issue of taxes mm -hmm. is very prominent. Yes. And you know, one of the things that disturbs me about the American democracy how a sophisticated country like that can allow Grover Norcos <laughs> to hold a whole party hostage on some no tax. I, I, I don't understand that. In a democracy where you represent people, you can let a private individual hold your representative mm -hmm. hostage. Uh, well, you know, all Grover Norquist <laughs> can do is to ask candidates for <coughs> office uh, to endorse a pledge regarding their position on taxes. They, they're free to say no. Mr. Reed. Uh, no, no, no. They don't have to. Uh, in fact, many of them you, say you're no. You're simplifying it, Mr. Reed. That's not <laughs> the case. That's, that is not the case, and you know it quite well. 
he held those Republicans to that. Oh, yeah, but why, what gave him that uh, power? You have to ask will. them. I don't know. All I know is from, I think from, where, from where I sit, right? Yeah. I find that astounding. Well, yeah, let's, yeah. let's speak to it. Uh, the, the only mm. way that he can have power uh, over, over legislators because of that pledge is if that pledge represents the views of the people back home. Otherwise, uh, they could say, I'm not going to sign this, and people back home would be happily reelect them. Re but I think that's reflective no, no, of a he lot was of views. Able, so. He was able to hold their feet to the fire. Yeah. Because he represented money. And he, the, the, those representatives or congressmen were afraid to go against him because money would unseat them. Oh, uh, Godfrey, I think you're selling short some of the, uh, the, the principle and the philosophy behind the no tax or no tax increase pledge. Uh, you're kind of assuming that higher taxes is the answer to our no, problem. No, 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 it's no, a no, bad no, thing no, if people no, pledge no, not to raise them. No, no, I'm not, no I'm not, I'm not, that's not my assumption. My assumption is that these people who signed that adhered to it because they didn't want uh, Republican money against them in the elections. Uh, well, I think you're selling short a lot of conviction. There are an awful lot of people who uh, take that position because they really believe it, uh, because it has merit, because the, uh, they believe that the answer to our problems in Washington is not higher taxes, because every time they raise them, they don't apply it to deficit reduction, they just spend more. Well, you, you're talking about 2% of the people uh, who the President of the United States wants to raise taxes mm -hmm. on 2% of your population who uh, has income, uh, they have income of over $250,000. And they pay about 50% of all the income tax revenue. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's not as though they're not paying. They're paying half the income taxes. Yes. But he would want them to go back to what they were doing uh, when President Bush mm -hmm. was in the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, they're resisting that. Yeah. Right? They signed a pledge mm -hmm. with this gentleman. Mm -hmm. We're talking about liberty and character now. Yeah. Shouldn't the wealthy in the United States of America, uh, shouldn't they wish, or shouldn't they want to go back to something that they were doing if it is in the national interest. Let's talk about the national interest of the country. Yeah, well, why is it in the national interest to raise money for a government that wastes $2 trillion a year? Why is it not in the national interest to reduce spending? Why is it always in the national interest to take more of other people's money? Uh, it seems to me what's in the national interest is what gets the economy growing and what preserves our liberties. Do you so think that those people are paying a fair share, the 2%, the they're paying a fair share of, of, uh, to, to the government? Well, now, re realize you've asked me a very broad question. Mm -hmm. So if I were to say a broad yes or no, you can always find somebody in that group that you could say, ah, they escaped taxes, or they did something they shouldn't have done and ended up paying a lower bill. But as a group as a whole, it's hard for me to say that 2% that pays 50% of the income taxes aren't already paying their fair share. But what worries me even more is that we're assuming that what the government takes their money to spend on is perfectly all right, shouldn't be cut, uh, when I think there is massive amounts of government waste. And, and, and I can't think of a good reason why anybody should send to Washington another dollar until they fix the spending problem. But the spending pro problem can be fixed simultaneously. But it won't uh, be fixed by raising taxes. They'll just spend it. That's what they always do. I mean, this is a debate we have about every three years. Shouldn't we raise taxes? Okay, and much of the time we do. Uh, but then we go back to the problem again of bigger deficits than ever before. Shouldn't we raise taxes again? The focus has to be on spending. We tax because we spend. And if we spend too much, there's no amount of taxes that can be fair uh, to cover that uh, extravagant Mr. Reed, bill. Mr. Reed, one, one of the biggest expenditure items of the U.S. government is defense. Yeah, it's way too much. Defense. Yeah. And, and one of the, on the other side, one of the arguments that expenditure is exacerbated by is, is, is the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. But shouldn't a country 
be responsible for the health of his people? Well, you, you've raised two questions. First, on the defense issue, I think there's a lot of savings to be made, but it, re it will require a redefinition of what it is legitimate U.S. defense expenditures are. Uh, right now, we have a kind of empire. We're, we've got troops and commitments in, in oh, 150 yeah. countries. Yeah. So until you redefine that and get it back to what I think would be within the confines of our Constitution, namely the purpose of the U.S. defense structure is to prevent uh, attack or to provide security for the American people, not provide Policing. The, uh, global police Policing. power. Yeah. yeah, so you've got to redefine that before yeah. you can really get the big savings. Yeah. On health care, rather than just assume costs are high, therefore more government's the answer, I think we should be asking, why are they so high? There are a number of reasons. One, uh, we have a third-party payment problem with health care that goes back to the late 1940s. Anytime you have somebody else picking up the tab for someone else's health care or whatever it is, you have a disconnect between the consumer of the purchaser of the, of the goods and the, uh, the, the payer. So then you have inherent inefficiencies. We started back in the 40s with this business of giving tax deductions to companies when they provide health care, but no tax deduction, uh, that is for their employees, no tax deduction equivalent for an individual who pays his own health care. So the, it, it drove the whole system in the direction of employer-provided health care. Uh, and it took the consumer out of the, out of the picture. That needs reform. Uh, but we also have at the state level with these expensive state government mandated health benefits, several thousand of them. Uh, and, and what that involves is where state governments have said to insurance companies, if you want to sell insurance in our state, you have to include coverages for all these various things. Some are better intentioned than others. But the problem is the more of those things you add, alcohol, uh, cost goes up. Uh, oh yeah, and it prices uh, low income people out of the health insurance marketplace. So I want to see, that we, I want us to fix the fundamentals rather than just assume that that's the, that cake is already baked and we just have to play with it. I think we need to fix the fundamentals or we're going to continue to have this problem of health care costs going through the roof. This is the platform and uh, we have as our guest uh, Lawrence Reed. We'll come right back. Back here on the platform this evening, uh, speaking with Mr. Larry Reed. Uh, Mr. Reed, uh, there are some Bahamians who believe that the U.S. political system is somewhat dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is dysfunctional because um, uh, politicians in your Congress are just not able to get it together. Um, they seem not to be able to compromise on anything. Uh, there is this ongoing debate now, mm -hmm. and uh, you have a fiscal cliff yeah. uh, that somebody is going to be pushed over this cliff <laughs> very soon. <laughs> yes. Why is your um, system so dysfunctional? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, let me say I couldn't agree with you more. It is dysfunctional, and I'll give you two reasons. They probably aren't the only two, but uh, I think they account for much of it. One is the sheer size and scope and duties, responsibilities, intrusiveness of our federal government establishment. Mm -hmm. If you look throughout history, whenever a society descends into expecting government to do virtually everything, to run almost every aspect of their lives, when it gets so big that it spends 20, 30 percent or more of what people produce, uh, inherently you get dysfunction and corruption. The reason is so many people either want to get in charge of this apparatus because it's so powerful, it's dispensing so much money, it's in charge of so many people's lives, it has the power to regulate anything and everything practically, they want to get in charge of it, or they want to keep it at bay. And so they're always fighting with each other. And inherently, the bigger government gets, the more uh, it tends to attract the least competent and the, those of the lowest character. Look at our politics in America today. Every campaign is dirty. Every campaign involves smear tactics. It's ugly. Why would a good person want to do that? So what happens is the more that it degenerates that way, the more good people say, I'm going to do something else. So what do you end up with? 
bad people who, who, who don't compromise, who don't, you know, uh, have all sorts of issues that uh, you, you wouldn't want in, go in any government, big or small. Mr. Reed, but isn't there, first of all, a role for government? Sure. And secondly, isn't there a segment of the population that only the government can extricate from marginalization, from, from uh, discrimination, from, from uh, you, you take black people, if it weren't for the government, slavery would not be abolished. So, so there's a role for government. Uh, well, on, the, on your last point, uh, Godfrey, on slavery, let's not uh, underestimate the importance of private individuals and private groups and private campaigns that led the way against slavery. Yeah, but it was the government. Slavery, I know, but it was also government that sanctioned slavery, that enforced it, that passed such laws as the Fugitive Slave Act that said if, if a slave flees, we will round him up, use the police power of government to force him to go back. So government was complicit in slavery. In fact, you can make a good case that it wouldn't have lasted, it wouldn't have survived if in, uh, without government support and sanction. No, I said it, it wouldn't have survived without the church. Exactly. <laughs> Look at the people who led the effort against it. They, they typically weren't politicians. They were private individuals who convinced the politicians eventually to, to vote right and to end slavery. But slavery was endorsed by most governments of the world before uh, largely private efforts to, to reinstill in people an appreciation for individuality and character and liberty, uh, finally convince the politicians to get rid of it. Well, not necessarily so in the British Empire, but let's look at the issue of people who have been marginalized yeah. and need a government hand up. Well, if I, uh, let's assume for a moment I agree with you. Uh, uh, but I don't, I want to say, because I, I think most of those needs are better handled in other ways. But if I did agree with you, and then I took a look at the federal budget, I would say, well, there isn't all that much in the federal budget that does what you are talking about. There's an awful lot of, of uh, extraneous stuff. There's, there's $100 billion a year in corporate welfare uh, that the government dispenses. Several hundred billion or more, uh, or more that we spend, as we mentioned before, in defense that represents the maintenance of empire, not the legitimate security needs of the United States. There's a lot more to this gargantuan government now than simply helping the needy. So much, in fact, that you can argue, I think well, that, the, that we're, we're keeping the needy in their desperate conditions because we're preventing growth in the economy that gives them opportunity. We're taxing uh, the productive who can create new jobs to the point where many of them are saying, forget it. Look, look how difficult it is to start a new business in America these days. I've talked to many young entrepreneurs who have dreams to start a business and, and, and hire people, but immediately they realize all the paperwork and, and the big guys are getting subsidies or special credits that I can't get. So they throw in the towel from the start and never even, never even begin uh, an enterprise. We need to fix that instead of just assuming that everything government does now is fine. We just need to pile on more of it. But shouldn't the government, um, Mr. Reed, protect the weak in the society? Those people who are unable to fend for themselves, those people, as Godfrey said, who are marginalized, uh, those people who are caught in the grip of poverty, isn't that what governments are for? Uh, I, I often hear that, uh, Wendell, but then I'm always, uh, I always want to know, what do you mean by that? Do you mean by help? Do you mean things like raising the minimum wage that prices some of those very people out of the job marketplace? If so, then I'd say no. If you mean creating generations of dependency, I'd say no. That doesn't help them. No. I, I mean when um, through bad policy mm -hmm. or bad policies, mm -hmm. uh, the state causes people to become unemployed. Yeah, then and it should get rid of those bad policies. Oh, oh, hold on. Mm -hmm. And people are on the street Yeah, and, and, and looking for sustenance, looking for food, yeah. looking for sh shelter. Mm -hmm. the, isn't it the government's role and responsibility to, 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 to give these people the kind of safety net that they should have and to bring them up? So I hear you saying that even if the government causes the problem in the first place, instead of fixing that, it should subsidize the outcome. But they should do both. 
Shouldn't they well, do why both? don't they fix the Shouldn't problem? Shouldn't they fix the problem, fix, uh, provide the kind of policies and programs to empower these people while at the same time giving them some relief? And in the United States, they, you call it welfare, don't you? Well, yeah, but most people Are don't... Are you against welfare? Uh, uh, well, uh, most people don't want to be dependent upon the government. Most people want opportunity. Yes. That's what we're crushing. Yes, and we're but, crushing but it with things like social welfare programs. Yes, but they are found, they, they, they are caught up in this vortex of, uh, and, and they cannot extricate themselves yeah. from it. Yeah. And, and they cannot extricate themselves from it because of bad policy. But it, and, until you fix the policy, isn't it, it do, doesn't the government have a moral responsibility to, to, to ensure that these people have food and shelter? Not a higher moral responsibility than stopping the problem in the first place by creating it. Yes, but you the have higher, the problem, I mean, Mr. Reed. The, the problem is here. We have the problem. The problem is that you have yeah. 20 million people who are unemployed. Yeah, but you know what happens? 20 million when people who are homeless. Every what time, do you do? What, what is the role of the government there? Here's the problem. Every time we say, okay, well, let's have programs for those people, we get the programs, we get the expense, we get the intergenerational dependency and all the harmful pathologies that that creates, and they never get around to actually fixing the problem. So it may sound harsh, but I'm one of those guys who likes to say, finally, for once, instead of just treating the symptoms, can we fix the disease? And, and, and but these people deserve liberty. Yeah. Uh, they are, are in the position that they are in mm -hmm. because of the bad character of their political leaders. Yes. Their political leaders did not have the characteristics necessary mm -hmm. to empower these people. And so these people have fallen through the cracks. Yeah. What do you do? Now, okay, now you, uh, you would acknowledge that even though we agree that there are bad policies, bad character on the part of the people who, in government who yes. create these conditions, yes. that there's also room for improvement on the part of some of those people who are dependent. I mean, yes. you, you, they're not, I mean, sometimes they're dependent because they've made poor choices in life, and you can't absolve them of that responsibility. You can't just say everybody who's in need is automatically a victim. No, some of them, in fact, have made poor choices. And, and there's no amount of government aid that may fix that. They have to fix their choices. Yes, but sometimes people are set up to fail. And governments yeah. set up people to fail uh, by bad policies. You had a housing crisis in the United States. Yeah, entirely uh, government caused. Yeah. Poor, poorly executed. Yeah. And, and a whole lot of people, millions of people, were set up to fail. Yeah. Yeah. What is the responsibility of the government when these people would have failed? The first responsibility is to stop the policies that created the problem. Yes, but that's, that's water under the bridge now. I know, but we keep... The horse is gone now. It's, it's bolted the ban. Right? I want to prevent the next crisis. But, if we but, never get uh -huh. around... It. But you have, the pri you have the crisis on your hands now. Yeah. What do you do with the 20 million people who you set up to fail because of your bad character? Yeah. These people yeah. want liberty. Yeah. And I'm using your theme, yeah. liberty and character. These people want liberty, and liberty is found in their being able to take care of their children, uh, uh, have uh, a shelter. Yeah. What do you do? You, you have to take the measures that will create, as soon as possible, a rapidly growing op economy with new opportunities. But in the meantime, you should give them something, right? Uh, well, uh, yes. A government that's tr a trillion and a half in the red, you're saying that it, we're supposed to spend even more? Again, I, I, I know but it's, it's your so fault that these it, people are failing. It, it is your fault that these people have fallen through the cracks. Well, it's not because my fault. Bad, I was against no, no, those policies. You're bad, you're, mm -hmm. Well, I'm speaking about the government yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Bad policies. Mm -hmm. Your bad policies, your bad programs uh, cause these yeah. people to fall through the cracks. Yeah. They are hurting. Yeah. Y you should bear some moral responsibility for, uh, to extricate them. Because they've fallen over the cliff. If I thought the government would help those people in the short run and fix the problems that won't uh, put them into the soup again, then maybe I'd listen to you. But, but in the, the problem meantime, is, what do you do? In the meantime, you've got to fix... I know. Let them suffer? Yeah, see, I'm not running for anything, so I don't have to cater to anybody. I don't have to say what will get me votes. Yeah, but in the meantime, have, what I'm, do you I'm, do? I'm, Let them perish? Oh. Mr. Reed? 
What was the last time the Salvation Army or the Red Cross said to a truly needy person, get lost? Oh, I see. So you, 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 you ship them off. Um, they, they are the responsibility of the Salvation Army and the Red Cross and not the government? Uh, Is that what you're I'm saying? I'm saying the government never has a monopoly on compassion. You're, you're implying, Wendell, that only politicians really care enough to help other people in need. And I'm saying there are people all around us all the time who will help a neighbor, who will help a friend, who contribute to uh, charitable causes. Uh, it, it's just not, you know. Yeah, but I'm it, saying that the state has a responsibility to these people because the state uh, uh, disempowered them with bad policies, and I'm bad programs. And I'm saying uh, with just as much insistence that the first responsibility of the government is to stop causing the problems that that uh, put them in that situation. And if, if somebody doesn't insist on that, and I can do it because I'm not running for anything, then we'll never do it. We'll just throw money at the symptoms and we never get around to fixing okay. it. Okay, Let's look at it from another point of view. Mm -hmm. Let's look at it, circumstances of birth. Mm -hmm. I'm born poor. Yep. President Obama, his wife Michelle, affirmative action. Mm -hmm. They go to Harvard to get a good education. Mm -hmm. He becomes president. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't have to be a, uh, a Kennedy or somebody to be able to afford to go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. The state has provided an affirmative action program which enables me to use my intelligence to get the best education that I am capable of getting. But you abandon that. How do you explain, Godfrey, how do you explain in the, say, roughly 1850 to 1900, in the absence of federal government aid, that we had tens of millions of penniless immigrants who came to the United States, in most cases poorer than the poorest who were already here, and didn't even in many cases speak the language, and yet pulled themselves up and built a great nation? How do you, how, how do you explain that? It was, Circumstances were different. Yeah, it was we, a different we were freer. World. No, it was a different world. We had a freer economy. No, it was a different world. And, and that world you're talking about, you could get by with, with, a, with a sixth grade education or eighth grade education. You can't get by in this, in this world without a college education. It's impossible. And many people, the way college fees are, are going up, just cannot afford it. And as you know, we have some of the highest rates of illiteracy t these days among high school graduates that we've ever seen in this country. But, but that, that, so that's, that's a fault of government that's schooling. Okay? No, that's a fault of the system, the educational system. Okay, who's in charge of that? I mean, in, in America, 90% of kids come through government schools for 12 years, and yet millions of them fall through the cracks. That's a failure of the government in that regard. Yeah, so what do we do? Throw more money at it? No, you have to fix it, like, like Joan said. You've got that's, to fix it. That's what I've been saying. You you, yeah, and it. you fix it through things like choice, competition. But you can't, you can't fix it by abandoning a program which is beneficial. But it's not beneficial. Public schooling is not no, beneficial. No, no, no. Affirmative, action is bene millions. affirmative action is beneficial. But don't you yeah. fix it by providing uh, better teachers, uh, giving teachers uh, higher salaries, uh, higher salaries and, and, and do, don't you fix it by smaller classrooms? Don't you fix it by giving uh, students who are unable to have a breakfast or lunch are uh, providing um, some subsidy for food? Um, isn't that the role of government? What is government for? Well, government, Mr. Reed, um, is supposed to provide mm -hmm. uh, safety, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. uh, good health. Which is not doing in our good schools. Good education. So <laughs> yeah. All right, that is mm -hmm. what the government mm -hmm. is for. Mm -hmm. And that is why you pay taxes. Yeah. But you want to absolve the government of these responsibilities. No, I, what I'm saying is that when you abandon that principal duty of providing security, safety, rights, and in this expansive new way, you would say you're crazy. How, you're not qualified. You haven't fixed the programs you already have that are going broke. And yet that's exactly what Obamacare promises no, no, to do. No, no, no. That's an oversimplification. It's a triumph of good intentions no, over no, no, reality. That, that's an oversimplification of what Obamacare is all about. Uh, and and I, I put it to you, since you're here to speak on liberty and character, that uh, a, a government is only a government of good character when the government is looking out for the less fortunate in the society. If you are not looking out for the less fortunate in the society, then you are not a government of good character. Well, then why does the same government 
continue to raise the minimum wage and price literally millions of young and unskilled workers, inner city minorities, out of the labor market. The same government that says we're all for you passes laws that say if you can't find a job that pays at least eight dollars or whatever an hour, it's illegal for you to work. But you have to raise the minimum wage uh, if people are going to survive because there are a whole lot of people who are not able to survive because of the high cost of living. And the high cost of living comes about by, uh, Godfrey, bad government policies, uh, bad programs, or no policy, or no program. Do you, would you concede that there is such a thing as a job that's only worth $6 an hour, let's say, because it requires low skills or it's not incredibly needed? There is such a thing as a job that is just worth only $6 an hour. Or is every job worth automatically what Congress declares? Well, you know what you're doing now, you know, you're reversing roles now. Uh, you're interviewing me. Well, I'm making my points by asking <laughs> questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is, if, if there is such a thing as a job that's only worth six, mm -hmm. and Congress says to an employer, sorry, even though it's only worth six, you've got to pay eight, do you think that employer is going to say, oh, I'll gladly lose $2 an hour and hire that person anyway? No, he just doesn't get hired. And that tends to fall on the inexperienced, the very young, the unskilled, the very people who need that first start on the job ladder. Okay. Mr. Reed, you know, many of the problems, many of the economic problems we face really goes to the market, you know. The speculators. <laughs> there, 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 there's no food, there, there, there's, there's no food shortage, but people buy up food, right, to control demand and supply. People buy oil to control demand and supply. And, and when, when, when uh, uh, demand is high and supply is short, they make a lot of money. So it's, it's market manipulation. Yeah. Well, uh, Godfrey, that's, a, that's a bumper sticker. Give me an example. I don't, uh, what are you talking about? This is a very broad generality. I'm talking about here's, let's here's use food, that. for example. Okay. We had a food crisis in 2008, uh -huh. right? So people bought food because they no, thought this, it was going to no, become no, more valuable. No, the speculators, the people who control food, the speculators bought food. Corn, for example. Okay. Right? And they waited for the price to go up. Okay. Now, if you're talking about, say, the commodity futures, <laughs> these things are always more complicated than you guys with the bumper stickers pr present them to be. But if you're talking about somebody who buys, let's say... Uh, and the futures market. Yeah, the futures market. The speculators. Okay, because they think the price might go up. That actually serves a very useful economic purpose. Because, if, first of all, if they're wrong, okay, and, and the supplies are more abundant than they expect and the value goes down, they're going to lose. Yeah, but, it's but, it's right but that, means, that means, Mr. Reed, that people should die of hunger? No. If they're right, the, the effect of buying the food now before a shortage hits is to make the future price le less high than it would be, raising the, the current price, evening out the effects of the shortage. No, there's no humanitarianism in that. It is all profit, greed. But it, but it ends up serving the consumer. If, if you didn't allow that sort of thing, if you, if, you, if you commanded that prices cannot move until the politicians have decided... No, 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 not the politicians. Let the, market, let the market have its way. You know, but when the market is being manipulated, you have people suffering. Yeah, but you well, believe in free market, uh, don't but, you? Uh, yeah, yeah, but you guys are you're just using these broad generalities. I mean, who's against, who's in favor of manipulation? But the... the, the what it comes down to where the rubber hits the road is what does that look like? What kind of a law do you want to pass? And who are you going to jail? And what's their crime? Uh, okay. that, that's where you okay. know, these is, bumper is, stickers become real. This is our final break. <laughs> the final break on the program. And uh, when we return, we want to talk a little bit about uh, big government. I, 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 I see a headline which says, Big government can't possibly be good government. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Let's take this break. We'll come right back. <music> this is the final segment of our program today with um, Mr. Lawrence uh, Reed, who is the president of the Foundation for Economic Education in the United States. And um, we said that we wanted to talk a little bit about big government can't possibly be good government. Yes. And um, I, I know we need another hour to deal with that particular issue. Um, but um, many governments um, in our region of the world uh, 
believe that the government has a responsibility uh, to, to assist in providing employment. Um, when the private sector fails, that the government should step in and, and, and provide employment. Obviously, you don't agree with that. <laughs> because I don't, because I see far more government failure than I, than I see success. And I see a lot of the chronic unemployment and cyclical unemployment as the result of bad government policies. So I don't, again, I don't want to keep treating the symptoms. I want to fix the problem, fix the fundamentals. And the, the point of that essay, uh, big government can't possibly be good government, is that we have to understand we cannot expect government to continue to grow and to attract at the same time the kind of good, fair, honest people that you'd want. Because the bigger it gets, the more it commands society, the more it tends to attract the, the power hungry, the corrupt, the people who are there to skim off what they can at other people's expense. And so that, that's why if you can imagine a government that takes, say, 90% of the people's production, could you expect that to possibly be a, a, a government of good, sound, honest, solid people of good character? No. Yes, but in Singapore, you have a, a, a model of, 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 of government that is exactly that. that uh, there's very little corruption, Mr. Reed. Uh, they provide uh, first-class uh, services in, in Singapore. Uh, it's, a, it's a model government for many countries of the world, including your country. And there's an index of economic freedom that's produced every, every year that ranks Singapore among the top ten freest places in the world. So it's got one of the smallest governments as a share of the economy. And in fact, when it comes to health care, we talked about that, they've had health care savings accounts for years, whereby you, you know, the people are empowered to put aside some savings tax-free and then pay their medical bills out of their own accounts. That's a better approach than, say, Obamacare, where the government take, uh, handles it for you. So I agree, Singapore is a good example, but maybe not in the way you thought. Yes, but it's Sing Singapore uh, 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 in, in empowers um, their people by putting in, 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 in place systems uh, that uh, enables people not to fall through the cracks, right? And when they do, the government has a safety net. But Singapore has one of the freest, they do the, 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 the least amount of that of almost any other country. They're rated as one of the freest in the world. Okay. Mr. Reed, sometimes, you know, the growth of government is involuntary. Mm -hmm. It's a tendency to believe that the politicians just create jobs for, for people and and government expands, right? Mm -hmm. But it's involuntary growth. I give you an example. The Bahamas is joining the WTO. Mm -hmm. To be able to function in the WTO is going to mean a whole new cadre of professionals, yeah. of civil servants. Mm -hmm. That is involuntary growth. If yeah. you want to, if you want to participate in 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 the in the, in the globalized yeah. world. Yeah. So it's even worse than voluntary growth. <laughs> no, 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 but it it, 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 it you know, when you when yeah. governments when countries stand on these conventions, yeah. Right, you, you have to grow your government to be able to participate. So this thing about big government, I I, I you know the, the jury is still out on that, you know, because there is involuntary government growth. I was in Montenegro, which used to be part of Yugoslavia, yeah. uh, two or three years ago, and one of the complaints there was that whenever they, if they join the European community, they would be immediately required to double their tariff rates in order to uh, be more fair to neighboring Serbia. And th uh, there's an example of where joining these conventions can actually set you back. I had, I talked to economists there who said, We've been trying to make Montenegro a free trade nation. Now if we join the European community, we're going to lose one of the biggest advantages that we've, we've tried to establish for our, ourselves. So I agree with you uh, that sometimes those conventions bring with them costs that yeah. may be greater than uh, the benefits. Mr. Reed, <laughs> liberty and character. Uh, yes. Uh, you should have a wonderful talk this week. Um, and I hope that Bahamians will go out to see uh, and, and hear you uh, because I believe that you um, 
can represent your side well in terms of uh, speaking for a smaller government and uh, all that sort of thing. Well, you're very kind, Wendell. Thank you. I'm grateful to uh, the Bahamas for uh, uh, the wonderful uh, environment you have here and the great uh, many friends I have, the Nassau Institute. And I hope Bahamians uh, will visit our website at fee.org, fee.org. Fee.org. Well, thank you so very much for being here today. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Wendell. Thank, thank you, Godfrey. Thank you, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for watching and listening to our program today, and we thank the Nassau Institute uh, for bringing to us their guests all the time. Um, every time they have a guest um, in from, out, uh, from, from outside uh, the country, they always... Uh, find a way to include the platform, and we thank them so very much. I'm Wendell Jones. Good evening, everyone.